another on-site meeting. Okay, we got another on-site meeting at Bajaya, 24th July, and this time with Philip Chang, Intercef. And his message is on the great collaboration, partnership in the gospel, text from Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. I believe we're going to have a great time. And uh, can I encourage every one of us to make it to the meeting? We've got an invited speaker. Last week, we had an improved attendance compared to the, uh, the, the, the other on-site meeting. Uh, last week, we had about uh, 18, pe 18 people. Yeah, and I hope we're going to improve as well as we have uh, people coming. Now, I guess all of us are very uh, are watching the news and concerned about the resurgence of COVID in the form of BA5. Uh, very infectious. It seems to be going everywhere else. Singapore now 10,000. UK has gone up to 350,000. US going up. But I've been keeping in, track with, uh, keeping in touch with all these things. And I want to assure you all, that even though it is this Omicron transmits very quick, uh, uh, quickly and it seems to evade the immune system, many of the reports I watch tells me that uh, while it is able to uh, uh, in, uh, evade the uh, immune system and give you infection or reinfection or breakthrough infection, the fact that you are vaccinated and boosted means that many people will have it light okay yeah they ate that it's worries about it being more severe but so far from what i've known it's still something that is manageable so and no country is going to go back to a lockdown okay so we have to live with that and i believe that we as we have heard last sunday yeah, about that faith lord if you are willing and we've, we've talked about the default mood of god that we now need to step out in faith right uh but Advised by many, many of those authority, health authorities, is that still practice your SOPs. Huh? Mask up, especially if you are in confer, uh, con, uh, confined area. So next week, please come. Don't be afraid to come. Please come. But do wear your mask. Do wear your mask during the service, all right? Except for the speaker who will be unmasked. The rest of us can be masked to reduce the risk of uh, infection. Praise the Lord. I know a few of us have already got COVID, nah? and uh, it's slight. Yeah, there's a little bit of inconvenience because we've been boosted, we've been vaccinated, and uh, the second line of defense, the B cells and T cells, is well able to keep us from slipping into severe conditions. So we have to thank God. We're going to lift and have faith and move on with the Lord. So next week, 24th July, please make it to uh, Kesha at Bajaya to listen to our speaker, Philip Chang. All right? Praise the Lord. Now, uh, just a quick run-through of uh, the uh, uh, next few meetings. 31st July, we go back to the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to learn so many things because there, Jesus, uh, uh, Matthew, by recording uh, uh, the life of Jesus and his teaching, gives us a very comprehensive understanding of what it is to live as a Christian, why Jesus came, why he died, why he rose again. So we're going to continue the series there. And then on 7th August, uh, we're back in Cassia, right? Live. It will be Communion Sunday. We are really going ahead to order the communion set. So we have communion in church together. And we will look at the uh, faith of the centurion. We're going to look again at faith, okay? Uh, the, the, the faith that Jesus said, I have not found anywhere in Israel. It's amazing faith of this century. We're going to look at it and see how we can learn to be people of faith. Okay, 14, we continue. And then on the 21st, we have an invited speaker again. This time is from an elder of Feather Park Baptist Church, right? So uh, one speaker a month. And then we alternate Zoom and alternate physical meetings. Until such time we feel comfortable, we're all going to be on the site all the time. Right. In the meanwhile, as we keep an eye on the BA infection and, its, uh, and the numbers that are going up, we will not let fear run our life. We're going to continue to trust the Lord for it, right? And uh, yes, uh, Eugene and Lillian and the family are in UK. We'll pray for them. Even right now, let's pray for them. Lord, I thank you. We pray that even as they journey, 
You give them journey mercies, protect them, let them have a good time as a family for the convocation of Joanne and for the holiday they're going to spend in Europe. Keep them in your in your under uh, your care and protection. May you protect and keep all of us and uh, them as well. In Jesus' name, we pray. Okay, that Amen. is the announcement. Okay, I'm going to go off this slide now. We, can, I think we're all recording already, huh? Eh? The streaming live as well. Eh? So, for those that are on Facebook, welcome to the message from Salt Shakers Church, right? And uh, Zoom as well. I uh, we are all on Zoom here. We have about twenty people on Zoom here. Let, let me share the slide for this morning, and we will continue with our preaching. Yeah? In a short while, I will let you have a little quick look at the Bible project. Yeah? Uh, summarizing from chapter 1 to 7 so that we have a sense of continuity. When we do a series like this, if we don't give overviews once in a while, we lose track of where we're going. So I, as a teacher, it's important that we keep uh, knowing where we are moving, what we have dealt with. So we're going to have a look, very quick look at the Bible Project, uh, chapter 1 to 7. And then I'm going to give a quick run through over what we have covered and the important things and what we're going to do today. So the beginning part is just some, uh, some housekeeping to make sure we are on track. But before I share, I have certain thoughts in my mind and hearts that have been here, uh, that have been with me recently. You know, even as we look at the world and the state of the world, we look at the war that's in Europe, Ukraine and Russia, we know uh, uh, every prediction is that it's going to be long drawn. Russia is going to continue to uh, try to take more territory. Ukraine is going to raise more soldiers to fight the West. Uh, NATO and US will provide more armor, uh, more weapons, and, the, and the, it's going to be a continuing thing. And it's going to disrupt the world in many different places. And we consider places like Sri Lanka, and we see that it's a failed state today. And so many different places. Every country seems to be in... Uh, heading towards disaster and uh, for us in Malaysia it's not it's not any different we're heading down a track that nobody seems to be able to stop it the uh, the slippery slippery slope that we are on nobody seems to have the power and the ability to stop it arrest it everywhere you look in the world as the scripture says there's gross darkness it's like the world is heading towards rushing in fact towards the end times, the destruction. But the promise of God is that when the world is in gross darkness, the light of Christ shines even brighter. So my thoughts is this, is that the church is not going to take over the nations like those who believe in the seven mountain uh, theology, uh, like in certain places. The church must take over the government, the church must take over education and bring in Christian life and then we have a perfect nation before christ comes. their basis for their belief is this whole area of what we call post-millennial post-millennialism meaning christ was, will not come before the 1000 year in fact this is the time when the church rectifies everything then christ will come and i think that is really not biblical because the way i look at the world today i think it's impossible for any human being on his own to try to rectify everything or the nation to come out of the disaster of this in fact it's heading to the fact of one strong man who's able to so-called do something that stops uh, this uh, culture war that's going on this power struggle that's going on and it's heading towards the one world government right that will try to replace that try to try to uh, take the place of the kingdom of god the kingdom of darkness always imitates the kingdom of God. Satan knows there's going to come the kingdom of God where Christ will rule over everything. He wants to get his kingdom today, the one world government. And no church in any nation is ever going to control the nation in such a way that we can change everything and make everybody obey the laws of God. That was never the intention of God. 
There's always been intention of God in the midst of darkness, in the midst of a commu of communities that are this that are lost and, and, and confused. God raises up a new community, the people of God. A people of God who in the midst of darkness are going to be salt and light. By the way we live, we're going to be salt and light. By the way we live out of beatitude, we're going to attract people. So a kingdom within the kingdom that's going to permeate the world. And the church will grow even as the nations become more wicked until the day of Christ. And that's what we believe in when we talk about the seven spheres, not the seven mountains. The seven mountains is similar in form and understanding about the this, this seven areas, but the theology is different. Seven mountain believes that the church can take over by power. That's why we fight, that's why they fight for elections. They fight to dominate. And that's, that battle is happening in the U.S. Because they believe that the church can take over. But that's not what the scripture says. The church is going to be salt and light. Oh, the wickedness of this world, the church is going to be salt and light. Having people saved through the glorious light influence of our lives. So that even as the world becomes even darker, the light of Christ is going to shine even brighter. And so therefore, it's so important for us to understand the Sermon of the, on the Mount because Jesus said, if you live by the Sermon on the Mount, okay, if we live and fulfill the law through the transformation of our hearts, the world will see a different kind of community and people will be saved. People will be drawn to who we are. If we can live the communion, lift the Beatitudes out, if we can understand what God wants to do in our life, that through our influence, we're going to see many come in. So we have the remaining chapter 7, which will take some time to help us understand. These are further instructions for kingdom living. We've done chapter 5, chapter 6. I'll go to very quickly up to us to give you the, uh, where we're going, and then we're going to look at chapter 7 in the first couple of topics that Jesus taught us in the Sermon of the Mount. But first, let us just look at this overview of Matthew chapter 1 to 7. Now, the, uh, the, the person speaks quite fast, but generally the idea is giving the structure of, the, of uh, Matthew and up to the point of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So please listen carefully, all right? The Gospel according to Matthew. It's one of the earliest official accounts about Jesus of Nazareth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. The book itself is anonymous, but the earliest reliable tradition links it to Matthew the tax collector, who was one of the 12 apostles that Jesus appointed, and he actually appears within the book itself. For about 30 to 40 years, the apostles orally taught and passed on their eyewitness accounts about Jesus, along with his teachings that they had all memorized. And Matthew has then collected and arranged all these into this amazing tapestry and designed the book to highlight certain themes about Jesus. In this video, we're just going to cover the first half of the book. Specifically, Matthew wants to show how Jesus is the continuation and fulfillment of the whole biblical story about God and Israel. That Jesus is the Messiah from the line of David, that he is a new authoritative teacher like Moses, and not only that, Jesus is God with us, or in Hebrew, Emmanuel. And Matthew's designed this book with an introduction and then a conclusion, and these act like a frame around five clear sections right here in the center, each of which concludes with a long block of Jesus' teaching. Now this design is very intentional and it's amazing. Just watch how this works. Chapters one through three, they set the stage by attaching Jesus' story right onto the storyline of the Old Testament scriptures. So Matthew opens with a genealogy about Jesus that highlights how he is from the messianic line of the son of David, and he's a son of Abraham. That means he's going to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. After that, we get the famous story about Jesus' birth and how all of the events fulfilled the Old Testament prophetic promises that the nations would come and honor the Messiah, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, but even more than that, Jesus' conception by the Holy Spirit, his name Emmanuel, all these work together to show that Jesus is no mere human. He is God with us. God become human. So you can see two of Matthew's key themes right here in the introduction. 
He's from the line of David. He's Emmanuel. But Matthew also wants to show how Jesus is a new Moses. So like Moses, Jesus came up out of Egypt. He passed through the waters of baptism, and he entered into the wilderness for 40 days. And then Jesus goes up onto a mountain to deliver his new teaching. So through all of this, Matthew is claiming that Jesus is the promised greater than Moses figure who's going to deliver Israel from slavery. He's going to give them new divine teaching. He's going to save them from their sins and bring about a new covenant relationship between God and his people. This Moses and Jesus parallel also explains why Matthew has structured the center of the book the way that he did. These five main parts highlight Jesus as a teacher. And he's created a parallel. Jesus as a teacher parallels the five books of Moses. Jesus is the new authoritative covenant teacher who's going to fulfill the storyline of the Torah. Now in the first section, chapters 4 to 7, Jesus steps onto the scene announcing the arrival of God's kingdom. And this is really key. The kingdom is in essence about God's rescue operation for his whole world. And it's taking place through King Jesus. Jesus has come to confront evil, especially spiritual evil, and its whole legacy of demon oppression and disease and death. Jesus has come to restore God's rule and reign over the whole world by creating a new family of people who will follow him, obey his teachings, and live under his rule. So, after Jesus begins healing people and forming a movement, a community, he takes his followers out to a mountain or a hillside, and he delivers his first big block of teaching, traditionally called the Sermon on the Mount. And here Jesus explores what it looks like to follow him and live in God's kingdom. And it's an upside-down kingdom where there are no privileged members. So the poor, the nobodies, the wealthy, the religious, everybody is invited and is called to turn, to repent, and to follow Jesus and join his family. Jesus says that he's not here to set aside the commands of the Torah or the Old Testament. Rather, he's here to fulfill all of that through his life, through his teachings. He's here to transform the hearts of his people so that they can truly love God and love their neighbor, including their enemy. So that's the brief summary yeah, of uh, what we've covered so far. And uh, to, to look at what we did, uh, we have covered chapter 5, where we quickly, we briefly look at the Beatitudes. Okay, we went through it, I re I summarized it in my own words, and I basically say that is the character of the people of the kingdom. And it shows us how we fulfill the law through the transformation of the heart. Not by keeping the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, and basically enabling us to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor, because this too enables us to fulfill the law. We fulfill the law by loving, all right? And so that's the beginning of the uh, 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 chapter 5, which tells us that these are the people of the kingdom. And, uh, and then we go on, chapter 5 goes on to talk, uh, so I've covered that, I put a tick there. And uh, chapter 5 goes on to talk to us about salt and light. And I remember when I did that with you, I mentioned that if we live the life of the uh, uh, life of the beatitude, all right, if we live the life of the beatitude, we become salt and light. So therefore, we have to be people of the kingdom, living the beatitude by being transformed daily. We're not perfect yet, but be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That was Jesus said. Be perfect. That means strive to be. So there's transformation, even as we become more like the Father, we become salt and light. And the world will be attracted to this new community of God's people, marked out by love. And then we talk about how Jesus fulfilled the law, right? We talk about how he fulfilled the law by, his, uh, by fulfilling every, everything that was ever spoken about him and by giving his life as to love us. And then as we covered, Jesus saying, but I say to you, bringing us to the essence of the Lord. We covered that, right? This one, we took a very quick look at it. There are so much that could have been done, but we did not have the time to do that. Chapter 5. So we covered chapter 5. Then we did chapter 6. And I did it under this uh, enemies of kingdom life. Because we want to say that the, uh, uh, there are spiritual disciplines for the people of God. And I want to encourage us, church, to look at this tree. Charity, prayers, and fasting, they must become 
part of our life as a believer, as people of salt and light. We must begin to care for the poor and serve the poor. We must begin to pray as Jesus teaches us to pray. We must learn to fast. But the greatest enemy to kingdom light is hypocrisy when we do these things. And sometimes we saw, we, we saw how we, when we look at charity, how people do it for a show, like the scribes and Pharisees. We talk about pray. They pray the publicly, everybody. See, they lose the essence of what the whole thing is all about. And they fast so that people may see them. So we talk about hypocrisy, which is the first enemy of the kingdom light. Then chapter 6 talks then about your storehouse, your eye, your master. There's three areas that if you have not determined what is most important to you, we end up worrying about life, anxiety. Anxiety, the second enemy of the kingdom of, uh, of kingdom life. Your storehouse, where is, your pre uh, where is the possession? Where is your treasure? Is it in heaven? Your master, is it uh, your eye? Are you generous or are you stingy? Your master, is it God or is it money? Because this will result in the anxiety and worries that will be a great enemy to kingdom life. We're not going to be salt and life if people look at us and see us equally frightened like the rest of the world about COVID, equally frightened about uh, the, all the things that are happening. But we, as we said last Sunday, we are forewarned by the scripture. We know there's a shaking and we live with a God of consuming fire. And we need to know that God is a good God. And so if we are, if we are marked out by fears and anxieties and worries, what can we offer to the world? So we need to understand that message. And so now we come to chapter 7. We actually covered Built on the Rock. The first message, I took the Beatitudes, and I said the result of it is that we become salt and light. And then I took you to the last, where I say that's the last thing that Jesus said, that if you keep all these things, you're going to be a house built on the rock. When the wind comes, the storm comes, it will not collapse. So we covered that. But today we want to cover judge not, ask, seek, and knock. These are important topics. Huh? Because if we as a people of God don't understand what Jesus said by judging not, and think that, we go one extreme and say that, oh, we're not even to discern what is right and wrong. We're going to be able, we're not going to be a true pillar of God's truth. The pillar of the church is the pillar of God's truth. And it has to uphold before the world what is right and what is wrong. What is morally right, what is morally wrong. What are the things that are sin? What are the things that pleases God? We have to be able to stand before the world and declare it. How do we do it? That's the question. And then we will talk about ask, seek, and knock in, in, in respect to prayer again. Second time Jesus talked about prayer. So let's begin. What does Jesus mean by do not judge? Let me just read the scripture with you and follow me. Today I don't have the video for you to listen because I decided to do uh, use ESV and I don't have scripture reading in ESV. So as I read, can you follow me uh, at home and read along with me, but mute, okay, so that we don't have all the confusion. Eh? Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes. And do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest you trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. First of all, let me give you overall pers uh, the perspective that may be different. If you connect all these verses, actually... The Lord is indicating to us that the proper judgment is what we're called to do. We are called to help our brother remove the speck out of his eyes. But we must do it the right way. We must not do it hypocritically. God wants us to help people remove the painful things of the, of the life, the sin of the life. But we have to do it in the right way. 
So coming back now, let's address verses by verses. Huh? Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is the kingdom principle of sowing and reaping mentioned in this aspect. Understand that in the kingdom of God, now there is a principle of sowing and reaping. It applies in every area of life. What you sow is what you reap. You sow good things, you reap good things. You sow generosity, you reap generosity. And so what is when uh, so so remember that this principle is important as a believer so that we will be like our Father in heaven. Whatever He does, we do. We sow to the Spirit and not sow to the flesh. When we sow to the Spirit, we, we reap life eternal. We sow to the flesh, we harvest death. That's what Scripture says. Huh? So this principle of sowing and reaping is a true principle. It's a principle in the natural world as well. You're going to plant papaya, you're going to sow papaya seeds, you're going to get papaya trees and papaya fruits. Okay? There will always be sowing and reaping. As long as the sun, moon, and stars, there will always be harvest. There will always be the season of sowing and season of reaping. That's why Jesus said, Don't grow weary in doing good, sowing good. For in due time you will reap. All right? So learn, learn this principle and see how it applies in your life in your business life, in the way you uh, treat people, in the way we actually sow or invest our life and time. In. For people who invest their wealth and their time and life into the kingdom of God, they will reap the benefits of the kingdom. So, but if we were to sow to ourselves, sow to our own selfish desires, we will not reap the benefits of the blessings of God. So remember that principle. So when Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged, we know very clearly he cannot be talking about don't be able to discern what is right and wrong. Because every, every time you say, that's a sin, people say, why are you judging me? That's not what Jesus said. Because we can recognize sin because we're the people of God. So, but what Jesus was speaking about is do not be judgmental. In other words, you're taking the place of God. You tell people what is your sin, and you also become like God, judging them for the sin, condemning them for it. So the idea behind this is not to be judgmental. And the, and the verse 2 is very important. If you are judgmental, you pronounce judgment on people in the way of being judgmental and condemning people, that's the same way you'll be treated by others. And if you do it very severely, the measure you use, you know, very big measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Principle of sowing and reaping. So understand this, our life, if we live in love, we sow love, we reap back love. And uh, it's so easy for us always to look at people and say, why are they like that? Why is that person like that? Why is the person not friendly? And, 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 we, and we begin to condemn them. Oh, these are not caring people. That is not good people. And because we do that, we find ourselves receiving the measure of our own judgment on people. So learn that first lesson. Jesus says, do not be judgmental. How do I know that's what Jesus said? Because in the same Sermon of the Mount recorded in Luke, Luke actually expresses that. Okay, Luke chapter 6, verse 37 to 38 is a summary of the Sermon of the Mount like Matthew, but he brings in his, under his perspective because... You see, this was oral tradition. They listened, they wrote note down. Sometimes Matthew may not note down certain things, but Luke note down certain things. So Luke and Matthew both say, judge not and you will not be judged. But Matthew, Luke goes on to say, condemn not and you will not be condemned. So that's the idea behind what Jesus said. Don't judge. Don't condemn people. It doesn't say that you can't say, hey, brother, that's a sin. All right? You can say that's not right. But you are not called to condemn and say this person is like this and kind of thing. Yeah? And then Leo goes on to say, forgive and you'll be forgiven. Just like, just like when you sow judgmental thoughts or, or words, you read judgmental words. Yeah? When you sow forgiveness, you read forgiveness from people. That's why some people seem to be so likable. 
you know, I, I pastored churches, right? So, and I do know there are some people that everybody love, everybody like. And I tell you honestly, these are the people who are not judgmental. These are the people who love, and even though they have faults, they're very quick to, uh, to, uh, to, to say sorry for their faults. Uh, but they, and they forgive very quickly and they're forgiven. And they're very open and friendly. And that's what Jesus wants us to be as a community. And then he goes on to say, in the area of giving, all right? Give, and it will be given to you. See, it's the principle of sowing and reaping. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put back into your, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Brothers and sisters, you cannot outgive God. If you do it grudgingly, say, oh, that's a law that says I must do that, you miss the whole point. But if you, with great joy and generosity of heart, gives what God instructs you or speak to you to give, God says, it will be given to you. All right, whatever form he didn't say, but he said, given to you. Good measure. You see, by the measure, you give it generously, generously, it'll be given back generously. In fact, God outdo you. Good measure, press down. In other words, when you, when you put things in, uh, you know, uh, into, uh, when, when you go and uh, collect things in the box or something like that, and there's those kind of things that has got a lot of space in between, you shake, 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 shake to make sure you, you get as much space as possible to put it down, right? So God's saying, I'll, I'll do that for you. Good measure, press down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your lap. Principle of sowing and reaping in God's kingdom for God's people is multiplied. With the kind of measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So let's look a bit more about this judging and find out what other scriptures talk about judging as well. Huh? So that we don't get caught up with the idea that God doesn't want us to discern what is good and what is wrong and uh, state what is sin and what is not sin. Let's look at what, uh, okay, now this is a, just a comment. Huh? So if instead of being judgmental, you choose to be forgiving, you will receive forgiveness from others. People will be very willing to forgive you. But when you are judgmental, you will receive judgment from others as well. Now, John chapter 3 verse 17. 3, verse 16, you are very familiar. For God sent His Son. Huh? You will know that. Now, his only begot Son, so that we will not perish, that we may have eternal life. John chapter 7, uh, verse 17 says, God did not send His world, Son into the world to condemn the world. Did Jesus call out sin? Yes, He did. He tells them the consequences of sin, but he didn't judge them yet. He calls them not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So, in our judging, in the same way, we are not called to condemn people and say, you are this kind of people, you are no good kind of thing, but we are called to bring people to salvation, just like Jesus bring people to salvation. So, I want us to look at this area of uh, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 6, as God telling us how to restore people. Not with a judgmental attitude. He's not saying, don't do anything. He's saying that you have to do it in a way by which you will restore. And how do we do it? In such a way that we will restore rather than condemn. Because if we come with con judgmental attitudes, it may reflect something in our own hearts, as we will see later on. Eh? Leave condemnation for the day of judgment. Jesus don't, didn't judge when he came. But he says, and uh, uh, he did say in John, uh, in the last days, the Father will judge. And then the Father will give the judgment to the Son because the Son laid down his life. And then Jesus said, and the Son will let the Word judge you. In other words, what's spelt out clearly, you will be judged by what you know by the Word of God. Right? So that's amazing. You leave condemnation to the day of judgment. Now, next thing, John chapter 7, verse 34, Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees because they were judging him for the fact that he healed somebody on the Sabbath day. And, uh, and he says, do not judge by appearances. Don't just look at what you think I'm violating the law, but judge with right judgment. What is right judgment? You see, Jesus did say, do not judge, right? But now he says, judge with right judgment. 
And I want to suggest to you, right judgment sees sin for what it is. That's why Jesus calls out the sin of the Pharisees and the scribes. He's not afraid to point it out. But this judgment becomes unrighteous, not righteous judgment when it comes from a holier-than-thou motive, when it seeks to condemn rather than to restore. With what attitude do we complain about people? And a lot of people uh, we hear today say, I don't want to go to church because they're all hypocrites inside. Uh, this, this scripture applies to us, all right? We're being holier than thou. Yeah, you hypocrite, I'm not. You know, you do this thing, I don't. So many people stay away from church because they say, yeah, you know, the church are full of hypocrites without thinking of the fact of themselves, right? So when we're able to say there's hypocrisy in the church, but we don't say it in a judgmental, holier than thou, we are broken because there's hypocrisy in the church. And we help people remove that speck by first removing our own hypocrisy, yeah? All right, so... It becomes unrighteous when it comes from a holier than thou. Or you see the sin of that person, but you don't see your own fault. And the interesting thing is that the speck and the log made of the same material. Right? So very often, uh, when we have the same issue uh, or problem in our life, uh, we see that in other people's life. We see the little speck. Same thing, because we have it in our hearts. So let's move on. Other things that Jesus, uh, when we talk about judgment, right? Judgment, uh, other points. Huh? What Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 is not forbidding judgment of any kind, in summary. Yeah? His point is to show that some people judge from a self righteous, condemning, and hypocritical stance. They point out specks in the eyes of others, not because they care, but because they get some cheap thrill from fault finding as if it makes them feel better about themselves. Some are so self-righteous that they are even blind to their own hypocrisy, being unable to see the lock in their own eye. So Jesus is condemning self-righteousness, hypocrisy, and an inability to judge ourselves rightly. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with a lot of us who have relationship issues. We don't judge ourselves rightly. I'll talk a bit more about judging ourselves, uh, not judging others. Uh, we are also called to judge our own lives, all right? and to make sure we live by what is the standards of God and be healed in our own life before we try to heal other people. Because when we are not healed in our own life, and our own life is like a big log, then when you want to try to heal somebody who has a speck, you will hurt and damage. And that's why Jesus said that his hypocrisy. Deal with your life first. So Christ's intention is not to forbid judgment that evaluates between right and wrong, moral and immoral. What Jesus is saying, don't take the place of God, who alone can cast into hell. Don't usurp the place of God. Don't stand as judge and jury. You know, in the same time, now we don't have jury nowadays. Huh? The same judge will listen to the case and give you the judgment. In the past, you have the jury as well. They say, don't be judge and jury. Right? So you don't be the one who listens to the case and at the same time uh, be the one who judge everything. I want, to, uh, I want us to look at this verse. I hope I got it right. Yeah? First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 2 about right judgment. This is Paul. Paul speaking about himself. Uh, let me give you a little background. This is judging himself. Huh? He says to the people in the Corinthian church, don't judge me. He says, what you should regard us, the servants of God, is that uh, uh, him, he was saying, regard the apostles as servants of God, stewards of the mysteries of God. But that's a very heavy responsibility for every pastor, every leader. We are specifically the servant of Christ for a local church. We are the ones who steward. Steward means you take care, you administer, you bring food at the right time, you bring the right thing for people to, to uh, uh, the steward of the house, take care of the cares of the house, the food for the people and everything. We are the stewards of the mysteries of God. And it's a very important responsibility. Paul recognized that. But he says that 
We recognize that uh, we, the servants of Christ, are steward the mystery, and it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Every pastor, every servant, every minister, first responsibility is to be faithful to the master, to his words, not to ourselves, not to what we like to do, what, to, what we think we should do, and what other people are doing, because there are so many people comparing this person with that person, this church with that church, and we don't even understand that every church is called for the season, for its purpose, for the, uh, for the, uh, the area of the kingdom of God that they are serving in. So, all that God is requiring of the steward, Paul says, is that we be found faithful to our calling. One of these days, I will be writing out the seasons of my life. And you will find that every season until today, God has a specific purpose of what I want, what I should be doing, and I do it faithfully. Okay? And now it's a season of life where I planted this church, and God has given me some uh, ideas and vision, and I believe I'm doing it faithfully. That's what Paul says. It's a very small thing I should be judged by you. Right? He was saying the Corinthian church was judging him as an apostle. He's a weak apostle. He's not like that apostle. He's not like this. Paul says, in fact, I do not even judge myself. The reason this strikes me is that sometimes, and I speak to some of us, uh, we can be very harsh on ourselves. We can judge ourselves. And uh, in the sense that almost like we, we condemn ourselves for what we think we should be doing or not doing. And, and at the same time, you know what God has called you to do, but then you have this feeling, oh, I, I'm, I'm not doing what people expect me to do kind of thing. Paul says, I do not even judge myself. So I am learning now. I am not going to judge myself. I will remain true to what God called me to do. I will not judge myself. And he goes on to say, yeah, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. In other words, he's saying, I'm not going to judge myself because if, uh, if I don't see anything wrong with myself, I will leave it like that. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean I am, not, uh, I, I, uh, I am okay. He says, I may not be aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. My ignorance doesn't mean that I'm right. But I'm not going to judge myself because he goes on to say, it's the Lord who judges me. So can I speak to brothers and sisters here? Don't be too hard on yourself, judging yourself that I'm not like this, I'm not like that. I've learned not to judge myself. I just learned to be faithful to what I know God has called me to do. I will not judge myself. Even though it may be true, I lack certain things, uh, didn't, uh, I may not be aware, but, and I may, I got, I'm not acquitted because I don't know it, nah? but I let God be the judge of my life. And Corinthians, uh, uh, Paul continues to say, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment on people, on things before the time, before the Lord comes who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. So can I suggest to us that in all our discernment of sins and weaknesses in people's heart, we let God be the one who will, when He comes, bring to light what's in people's heart. Then every one of us will receive our commendation or our judgment from God Himself. So we are, called, we are not to judge the motives or purposes of the heart. We can call out sin, but we don't judge the purpose and motives of the sin of the heart. All right. So that's, that's an encouraging verse for me. I hope it encourages you. Don't be too hard on yourself. All right. If you do faithfully what you know to do, go on. Don't let people's word be a stumbling block to you. But of course, we are to... Always examine our own lives. And if we realize, if we don't realize, God, Paul says, I'm not. Again, Albert, you are. Is Pastor Albert frozen again? 
And it is so. Sow the right things and receive the right things. Wanting to take the speck out of people's eyes. This is what it means to love people, to help people move on in life. You can see it, but you must first see the lock in your own eye. Because if you don't see the lock in your own eye, you will not be able to take the speck out of other people's life. In other words, heal yourself first. Let yourself be healed. If you think someone needs to be uh, uh, needs to change and you pick that up you're able to see that so clearly look at their own sin and say in my life am i having the same sin if you think somebody is controlling look at your own life are you controlling because often we are we see what is in our life we identify sin easier when it is the ruling sin in our life okay this is the kind of judging that Jesus warns against. Hypocritically trying to remove the speck in someone's eyes, else eye when you have the entire lot in your eye. So Matthew chapter 7 verse 5 says this. Huh? You hypocrite, first take the lot out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. The ministry that God has provided in the church, the word that God speaks to us on Sunday is always first and primarily for us. We receive it first. And then in humility, as God de deals with us, then with the comfort with which God has comforted us, we're then able to comfort others and help people remove the speck out of our brother's eyes. And when we judge with hypocritical judgment, this is the tendency of human prideful flesh. We either feel we are spiritual, we are better than the other person, and we are unable to commiserate and have compassion with people. Let's look a bit more about hypocritical judgment. Hypocritical judgment makes me look spiritual, okay? that I can call out sin makes me look more spiritual. It makes me look better than others. It's exalting myself among people, which is what the Pharisees did. That's why the Pharisees will turn up their nose at the people who did this and that. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. Outside looks clean, but inside are full of bones. So we are never to do this. But we can, like Jesus, say what is sin. What is morally or immoral? What is moral, immoral? But from the position of one who has dealt with that sin ourselves, and we now come humbly to help others get rid of that sin. Yes, so that we can humbly come to a brother and say, Brother, can I help you? I, I understand what you're going through. I've gone through it before. And uh, this is what God did for me. Can I help you? Can I help you? And begin to volunteer help. Now that's the community that God wants us to be. A community that will judge righteously, right judgment. That will look at the needs of people and not come with a holier-than-thou attitude but will come alongside the person and say, can I help you? And that's the problem today. 
where people want to help people but have not been able to get rid of their own sin and come with hypocritical judgment. Look at what Romans chapter 2 says, uh, just in case we think that being able to uh, judge means that we are exempt from judgment. Uh. Romans was, uh, Paul was speaking to the Jews because they thought they had the law, they have everything, they were people of God, and they looked down at the Gentiles. So that was in the context of the Jewish nation and the Gentiles. But it can be the same context for us who thinks we are believer, we are saved, we are more righteous. The hypocritical thing that Jesus addressed that when we pray, we pray like this way, when we give charity, everybody sees, when we fast, everybody knows we are fasting. So he's saying that, Paul said, therefore you have no excuse. Oh man, every one of you who judges in that judgmental way, yeah? for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. It is true. Whoever does this evil thing, God will judge. But how can you think you stand in the place of God? I'm, I'm rephrasing now. And judge people when you yourself do it. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Why is not God judging us, even though we are full of this self-righteousness? Because it's of His kindness. His kindness is meant to lead us to repentance, not to put us in a place as we've we think we are better than others and then start to be like God, you know, judging people and putting our finger, calling out people, not only calling out their sin, but addressing the motives of their heart and saying things that are unkind about people. Finally, and we end. Matthew 7 verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest you trample them underfoot and turn to it. What is this verse in connection to the first five? In many scriptures, people separate this as a separate thing. But I think that it's connected. And I'll tell you why I think it's connected. Because I think Jesus is telling us, be careful that you offer help. Because this whole aspect is helping to remove the speck in people's eyes. So be careful that you offer help. What is holy? Your love, your compassion, your kindness. That you offer help only to those who are willing to receive help. Do not go around offering help without discerning whether someone wants or is ready for it. Because what happens is that you take something precious, you give to a... He wasn't calling people dogs, uh, but we know what dogs are like. Dogs can turn on the person. Same like pigs will trample on the precious things. So he's saying that you're bringing something holy, the holy things of reconciliation. If you don't discern whether a person is ready or not, and you simply just want to help, be careful that they don't turn around and trample you underfoot and attack you. And I think that's tremendous wisdom. We don't just go around trying to help everybody. We have to determine, is the person ready for help? If the person is not ready for help, don't try to volunteer. Because not only will you be turned on, they will trample you underfoot. That's what Jesus said. And you're going to find yourself wounded from trying to be a healer. That's how I see chapter six, uh, chapter 7, verse 6, uh, judging others. Let's move on. Next part, and we'll finish. Uh, ask, seek, and knock. Chapter 1, uh, the, uh, the remaining verses, uh, 7 to 8. Jesus continues and say, Ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. This is like greater intensity of seeking. This is prayer. You can ask. It will be given to you. But there may be times you need to seek. And, and ask could be asking for things from God. Seek could be finding God. I'm seeking you, Lord. I want you to know you. I want to know you better. And God gives himself. Say, when you seek me, you will find me. You will find me. Knock. Maybe opportunities that needed, uh, uh, open door that needed. Knock. Open to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. I want to connect it to last week's sermon where I say that God is a good God and the default mode of God is I am willing. 
So, God, whatever you ask, seek and knock, let's stand on the premise that God is willing. Right? So that we don't have to say, does God want me? Does God will not do this? No, just stand on the premise that God is a good God. He is willing. All right? But let's look again at the exemption, exception that I mentioned last week, and I'll add one or two more. The default mode first, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim among you, Savannah and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, ambivalent, but in him is always yes. Okay? So the default mode of God is yes. All the promises of God find their yes in him. That's why it's through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. So there are exceptions, and we'll very quickly finish the exception, and we'll finish for this morning's message. Yeah. James 5.16 says, The prayer of a righteous man, I quoted to you last week, Therefore confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. Say you're asking and seeking for healing, because the prayer of a righteous person has great power. So what's the exception? Unconfessed sin. Unforgiveness, unconfessed sin, God wants, but these are the blockages. So we ask, seek, and knock. There are exceptions to it, and it has nothing to do with God. It's more to do with us. Unconfessing. So let's look at our life and let God deal with sin in our life. Next, 1 John 5, 16-17. I would mention this last week too. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There's a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. And we want we're not going to expand it a bit more, but sometimes the Lord says, Do not pray. Because that's that's a sin that leads to death. And so we will leave that to God and uh, we're not asked seek or not. Right? James 4:13. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. This is a description of the whole mess, why the world is in a whole mess. Okay? Not only between you, you and your family, but the nations. This is, this is what James says. And you do not have because you do not ask. So, do not take this verse, ask, seek, and knock, and say, God knows everything, so, so why do I need to ask? Well, James says, you need to still ask. You need to verbalize. You need to come and pray. You need to seek God with brothers and sisters in the prayer meeting at home by yourself. You need to ask. You need to keep on asking. You keep, you keep on seeking. You keep, you keep on knocking. You don't have because you do not ask. So don't stop asking. Don't stop seeking. Don't stop knocking. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passion. So another exception would be you asking, seeking, knocking for things that you want to spend on your passions. You ask wrongly. So therefore, the answer does not come. And one final one, no? which is in the scripture itself. Huh? Matthew 7, verse 9 to 11. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? So, are you a bad father? Your son asks for bread, you say, nah, here's a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Are you a bad father? You want a fish? Here is a snake. It's actually trying to say, when you ask and seek God, uh, uh, even you as a natural father will not do it. Do you think God will be like that? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? So the qualifier on us is this, exception. When the things we ask for are not good in His eternal plans for us, and we will never really know until we go to heaven why some things we think are good for us, but God says no. So, this is not like uh, everything you ask for get because God knows ahead of us our future. And He knows that some things He gives us now is not going to be good for us in the future. So, only good things God will give to us. So, may we have a fulfilled life. May we have a great time with God, journeying with God. Have faith to ask, seek, and knock. And when things don't come, just leave it in God's hands and say, Lord, you know better than I what is good for me. 
And if God reveals unconfessed sin, confess your sin. So may God bless His word today. Amen. Uh, we shall stop recording now. Uh, I mean, in.